everyone, and welcome to the Dry Dock episode 251. This week, the video, the questions are taken from the videos on guides 304 and 305. That's HMS Monmouth and the T-Class submarines of the Royal Navy. And the Wednesday videos are the Battle of Actium and the Trafalgar campaign, not the Battle of Trafalgar itself, which was Admiral Nelson part three. And uh, then a question or two intruding from the Hot Wings challenge video that I did. Ark Dennis asks... Why did naval designers persist in putting casement guns so low in the holes for as long as they did? It seems strange they ignored the risks of water ingress, doubly so for the British, who spent a lot of time sailing around heavy northern waters. Part of it is just a lack of appreciation of how fast things were scaling up. Because if you look at this, for example, this is a Monmouth-class cruiser, and you look at the people on the bow, and you can tell that, you know, this casement, the lower casement battery, which is dangerously low for the time period, is still more than six feet comfortably above the water. And when you think about the fact that ships of the line were maybe considered a little questionable when their lower gun ports were three foot above the water line, <laughs> and this is more like you know seven or eight foot, it's not terrible. And then you look at the gun portal port height of some of the other early ironclads. I mean, heck, the, look at the height of USS Monitor's guns above the waterline. And compared to all of them, even the lowest of Monmouth's six-inch guns are still well higher than that. But what had changed was the speed, because if you're moving at single-digit knots, maybe in the case of a ship of the line going all out, maybe at 10, 11 knots maybe a fraction more, the height of the waves produced by your bow wave and, you know, washing back along the side of your ship are not going to be that, that high. But the faster you go, this builds up exponentially. So all of a sudden, if you're building ships capable of 20 knots or more, yeah, now, now you have a bit of a problem. And if you don't realise that then you're going to end up with ships like the Monmouth class, which have pretty useless lower gun batteries. And you combine that with just how quickly they were building ships at that point. So if you trace the line of cruisers back, you can say, look at HMS Powerful and HMS Terrible. They also have double stack casements. Now, both Powerful and Terrible, their designs are frozen in the very early 1890s. They're laid down in 1894. They only complete in 1897 in the case of Powerful and 1898 in the case of Terrible. So for experience to point out that actually these double-decked casement guns aren't really working out that well, you're going to be looking at, you know, Let's, let's be really generous and say that Powerful's trials show this as a problem. So you're not actually going to realise it's a problem until the end of 1897. You've then got to feed that back to your designers and figure out why it's a problem. Is it something to do with a hull form? Is it something to do with the exact placement along the hull? What is going on? So you're probably only really cottoning on properly to the idea that this is a pretty bad idea in mid to late 1898, which is around the time that Terrible's sea trials will also be coming in. The problem is that Monmouth is laid down in summer 1899, which means that Monmouth's design, if we assume that, you know, someone's cotton on pretty quickly to the fact it's a bad idea in the powerful class, Monmouth's design is being frozen around the time that the idea is being shown to be a bad one, in the best of circumstances. And in the interim, you've got the Diadems, the Cressies, and the Drakes all being built with double stack casements, plus then the Monmouths. And, you know, under probably more plausible circumstances, they've only realised it's a really bad idea after the design's been frozen, possibly after the first of the Monmouth class has been laid down, at which point it's a bit late to do anything. And that's before other design considerations come into play in terms of you know cost, displacement, other armament, eventually when you get things like the Devonshires and the Duke of Edinburgh's, which are the successors to the Monmouths, it seems at least to me that in part the designers just turned around and went, you know what, actually, 
will accept the six inch battery only really working in calmer weather in exchange for getting a much more powerful primary and well in some cases secondary battery put in because the devonshires have uh, quite a number of four point of uh, 7.5 inch guns the duke of edinburgh's have even more 9.2 inch guns so in both cases their secondary six inch guns are perhaps a little less important and then you got into the warriors and the minotaurs the last armored cruisers the royal navy produces and by that point everything's in turrets and much higher up pilot mix 23 asks is it possible to future proof a treaty ship for a higher displacement by putting ballast tanks filled with water in and then removing them to add hardware to the ship later on. I'm not sure the ballast idea per se would be a good idea. Um, for one thing, it may or may not actually be counted in with standard displacement, depending on exactly how picky people want to be. For another thing, ballast tanks are very deep in the ship. So if you put loads and loads of additional ballast tanks in, one, you'd be compromising volume deep in the ship that would be needed for other things like the magazines and the engines. And two, when you did eventually drain a bunch of them in order to free up weight to put a bunch of additional equipment up top, you'd be creating a lot of additional heavy equipment up top and an awful lot of relatively light, sort of um, empty volume down in the bottom of the ship, which would seriously affect its stability which is not a good thing. However, standard displacement as defined in the Washington Naval Treaty does allow for um, the fresh water supplies for the crew to be counted towards standard displacement. And if they do that, that's another difference. That's another story entirely. So instead of doing ballast tanks, you could instead design a ship that's a little bit overly large, but has been designed to be stable with a truly absurd amount of onboard fresh water. And you could justify that by saying, oh, well, you know, we want our crew to have the absolute pinnacle of luxury. They are on, a, are on a, let's say, a cruiser, for, for example. And uh, so they're going to be going out across the world, very long distances at sea for very long periods of time, uh, lots of hot environments. So we want them to be able to have more than a 30 second shower. And so we're going to have you know, loads of fresh water tanks scattered all around the upper parts of the ship, which would make the ships uh, fairly popular, um, at least for a while. And then because you have a bunch of really heavy stuff really high in the ship, if you then took that out and you went back to having a standard amount of fresh water and instead put in a bunch of other fairly heavy stuff, because let's face it, water is fairly dense, like anti-aircraft weaponry and radar and all other sorts of things, you'd probably get away with that a bit more and have a ship that's in a somewhat better state than you would with trying to do it with just ballast. Niels Larsen asks, if those who control the money are so worried about the fleet's cost, why do ship types with very specialist roles keep appearing, like the Monmouth class for hunting small cruisers, or the dreadnought armoured cruisers dash battle cruisers in general? Wouldn't standardisation be the obvious better choice to be the most cost effective? It's a good question, actually. You see exactly this argument being hit back and forth, not just between the Treasury Departments of various nations and the Navy of that nation, but also internally within the Navy as well, because obviously everybody has their pet projects. And if somebody's specialist project is eating all the funds, it's very easy to attack it and say, you know, we should have cheaper, more generalist chips to go with. The problem that the bigger navies, at least, face around this time is that essentially if you build something that's a decent standard ship type for a particular role so whether that be a destroyer a cruiser whether that be protected or armored or both or a battleship if it is a relatively budget conscious standard type it's also going to be very easy to reproduce which means that your potential rivals should, in theory, be able to near enough copy that design and build a fair number of their own, at which point it becomes a sheer numbers game if more than one nation wants to be top dog in the naval world. Essentially, who can build the most of this standard type? They are the winners, which means a lot are going to get built. 
which means not only do you have a bunch of ships that kind of jack of all trades, master of none, but it's costing you a fortune because you're having to produce dozens and dozens and dozens of them. Whereas, you know, and, th- and you know, to be fair, this kind of thing does occasionally catch on in various large navies. They'll build a whole tranche of relatively cheap, usually, although not always, relatively decent standard-ish type ships. And then this escalation happens, and then someone points out, well, okay, but if we build a few, admittedly more expensive per hull, specialist ships that are designed to destroy what's now the standard type, they can go and wipe the floor with all of these standard type vessels, but we don't have to have that many of this very expensive specialist type, so overall the cost is less. So using cruisers and battle cruisers as an example. The first battle cruisers cost about two to three hundred thousand pounds more than the last generation of armoured cruisers, which is about the price of an armoured cruiser and a small protected cruiser. And if you want to use, say, the mid-range estimates for the cost of a Minotaur-class armoured cruiser and a town-class or an Arethusa-class protected or light armoured cruiser, versus the high-end cost for an Invincible, you could get an armoured cruiser and a protected cruiser, or three protected cruisers and a bit of change for the cost of a single battle cruiser. So the battle cruiser is significantly more expensive. But the battle cruiser could destroy any of those combinations quite easily and walk away relatively unscathed, and more so. So you then have the argument of, well, we could build let's say, half a dozen battle cruisers, so the Invincibles and the Inflexibles, let's say, and that'll cost us just a bit over £10 million. Now, admittedly, for £10 million, you could have gotten, let's say, seven and a half armoured cruisers, so not that many more, but it's an extra hull and a bit. Or you could have gotten, if you want to go with a fairly expensive protected protective cruiser, protected cruiser, I should say, um, then you could potentially get quite a lot of hulls. You could get 21 hulls for the price of six battle cruisers. But again, you run into the problem of six battle cruisers can easily wipe the floor with even eight armoured cruisers. And although it might take a little bit of hunting down, 20 protected cruisers versus six battle cruisers, the six battle cruisers will eventually find and kill them all, which means that's a net saving. And that's assuming equal numbers, because of course, if you build, if the enemy builds, let's say we're, we're taking our 10 and a half million, if your enemy builds eight armored cruisers, well, if you're the superior navy, you can't just build eight armored cruisers in reply because they're the ones that you're trying to catch. They could be all over the place. So you're going to have to build 16 armoured cruisers. So you're going to have to spend £21 million, at least, possibly more, to have a force that's capable of tracking down and reliably destroying a force that the enemy has built for £10.5 million. Or you could build six battle cruisers for £10.5 million and easily hunt down and wipe out the enemy. So although the individual hulls seem to be more expensive, Strategically, it's actually technically a cost saving, with the one big assumption, of course, that everybody will go along with your plan. And then the Germans build von der Dan and the whole thing goes out the window anyway. But that's basically where you get the specialist ships from. A lot of the time, it is actually an attempt to reduce cost by having a specialist ship that's very, very good at dealing with a bunch of standard types. People just keep forgetting that when you do that, the new specialist ship becomes the new standard. Josh Thomas Moore asks... Of the ships that received a modernization between the wars, which ships were the biggest missed opportunity for a great modernization? Well, Hood is the obvious easy one. Um, I think we've covered that plenty of times before. But Repulse is another good one. Now, if Repulse had been refitted to the same standard as Renown, would she have survived the encounter that eventually ended up sinking for said? Who knows? Maybe, maybe not, but she certainly would have had a heck of a better chance. So Repulse would be one. The main problem, when at least when you're looking at the big ships when they're modernised, comes down to speed. The QEs, well, Warspite, Valiant and Queen Elizabeth, still had some relevance because with their refits they could do 24, 25 knots. 
obviously renowned, had an excellent service record during World War II because she was already fast, made a little bit quicker and made into a fairly capable ship. But when you look at everything else that's not a QE, renowned repulse or hood, in terms of the older ships, well, the R's are slow. Nelson and Rodney, for that matter, are still relatively slow. All of the standards are slow. The Italian ships are slow, but they spent a stupid amount of money modernising them to be relatively quick. The French ships are slow. The Germans don't have any. The Russian ships are quite heavily modernised, um, at least in the case of o October Revolution, but they're really a bit too old. So what does that leave you? Well, you've got the Japanese, the Congos and the Nagatos. Now, the Congos were pretty modernised, the Nagatos were somewhat modernised, um, and really the Congos and the Nagatos are the only ones left that have a kind of an inherent speed that could be either maintained or boosted a little bit with a reasonable modernization. And since, as we said, the Congos were modernised, then the apart from Repulse, the other big missed opportunity would perhaps be the Nagatos. If the Nagatos had been given a full and complete workover similar to the last of the Congos, that might have got them up to a speed where they would be competitive with the fast battleships. They've got an armament to be competitive with the fast battleships already, but with the additional speed, modern fire control systems, etc., etc., and maybe, who knows, maybe just a little bit more armour, um, <laughs> then they could have been potentially quite effective, assuming, of course, that the Japanese actually bothered to use them. Uh, for everything else, unfortunately, you are basically either looking at to get them vaguely competitive with modern fast battleships, spending an absolute fortune lengthening them and completely reworking them a, a la the Italians, which would be, and even then you've got to find something that's got the firepower to start with. So you'd be looking at something like Nelson, Rodney, the Colorados, and we've already covered Nagato. Anything else, really, the best you're going to do is come up with a pretty good shore bombardment ship with decent AA, which is what happened to a lot of the American standards. Cameron Sowers asks, why did old submarines have rows of holes in the outer hull? And why did they stop having those holes? And when did they stop having those holes? So these holes are to help with the submarine draining air, well, and draining water. Basically, when it's submerging and when it's surfacing, the old submarines like this, the pressure hull is actually, you know, this mostly cylindrical thing that's actually deep inside this outer casing, especially this bit that has all the holes in it, which is the superstructure, which is above the casing and above the ballast tanks. Now, if those holes weren't there, then when the submarine tries to submerge, you'd have a big air bubble trapped, which would be a problem. And if, if it, again, the holes weren't there and it was trying to surface, it would take quite a while for all the water to drain out. So by having these holes in this superstructure, it means that the volume that the superstructure encloses around the pressure hull is much faster and easier to drain. Now, when these things start to disappear from submarines, basically is, well, after the period this channel covers, but essentially once submarines move towards what's now more familiar, the more cylindrical or teardrop-shaped outer hulls, uh, especially once you adopt nuclear propulsion, because at that point the profile of the pressure hull and the profile of the outer hull are much, much, much closer, and mostly that space is, as far as I'm led to believe, full of stuff like ballast tanks, and not just massive pockets of air that could impede the raising or lowering of the submarine, and hence you end up with them disappearing. Exactly when, at some point in the early Cold War, again, not a little bit past this channel's period of uh, expertise. Brendan Boersdorf asks, what are the pros and cons of a galley-type ship versus a normal sailing vessel in the Roman period? This is from the Battle of Actium video. So as far as the Roman period goes, a sailing vessel, generally speaking, can be made larger and can carry more cargo. It can also go longer distances without having to stop because it's got a much smaller crew and therefore it's much easier to accommodate the food and water requirements of the crew and, to be honest, even the sleeping requirements. 
versus the trireme, the galley, the bireme, the quadreme, whatever you want to call it, that's going to be faster in the sprint. It's going to be more agile. It's obviously independent of the wind when it needs to be. And it carries more men per unit of wood expended. Therefore, it's a more efficient warship. So basically, if you want to go long distances moving cargo and you're willing to be at the mercy of the weather somewhat, you want a nice big Roman era sailing vessel. But if you want to be fast, agile and able to conduct combat in most conditions, then you want a galley type rowing vessel, i.e. a trireme uh, or similar related vessel. Now, of course, there is a little bit of overlap. You do get some rather large row rowed vessels with a single sail or potentially multiple sails, quinqueremes, heptaremes and so forth. Exactly what the Syracusia was remains open to question as well. But broadly speaking, if you're looking at a dedicated warship in the Roman period, it's going to be some kind of ward vessel with a sail or two. Whereas if you look at the majority of Roman merchant vessels that are traveling on long distance journeys with bulk cargoes, they tend to be sail only. Sean Quigley asks, I noticed you mentioned the Romans considering the use of small amounts of salt water on a ship's ship fire useless as it only intensified the fire. Is it possible they used some ingredients in the preparation of the lumber or caulking of the ship that would cause this? And is that perhaps the ingredient that caused Greek fire to be considered unextinguishable for those who describe it? Well, a lot of warships at the time would have been relatively recently built and probably not out of particularly seasoned timber. So potentially you've got timber there that's got a fair bit of resin still in it. But certainly they would have been corked with bitumen and so forth, which is, of course, a hydrocarbon. So if you have a ship fire that's really gotten itself going on a trireme or other similar vessel in battle, then um, you might have resin fire going which or fueling the blaze, which is obviously going to be a problem. But you're almost certainly going to have melted, bubbling and burning bitumen and obviously because it's going to be fairly raw bitumen, they use various hydrocarbons therein plus possibly any paint that was involved um, in the ship, any waxes that they were using, anything they used to try and preserve the ship, probably all on fire and burning as well, at which point if you splash it with small amounts of water, and let's face it, it's almost certainly going to be salt water because that's what's readily available. You're going to have precious little drinking water aboard anyway, um, let alone enough to seriously fight fire. So you splash basically water on what's going to be a mixture of burning oil, wax, and as in oil, as in you know, vegetable oils, waxes and hydrocarbons, yeah, the chances are all that's going to do is make it flare up and spit various gobbets of burning stuff at you even nastier. So they're probably going to turn around and say, yeah, that, that's not a bad idea. Let's not do that. Uh, now, as per my Greek fire video, I've hypothesized, along with several others, that naphtha and pine resin were key ingredients of Greek fire. So there would be an element of that certainly involved. Um, not necessarily the entire thing, though, because there are other, other elements of Greek fire that um, need to be accounted for in terms of its behavior. And others in the comments have suggested possibly, considering they had it around, the Romans might have chucked some olive oil in there, as well as, you know, hydrocarbon oil because we all know how violently oil fires react to you pouring water on them. So who knows, you know, when I, when I do a larger scale test of Greek fire, maybe I'll include some olive oil in a test mixture and see what happens then. It, that's not going to be the secret ingredient and nor I think would be bitumen, tar, um, resin or wax, although they could all be involved in the overall recipe because they're all fairly common things, fairly widely known. So although they might make up part of the recipe, I don't think they're the secret ingredient because the secret ingredient would, by inference, have to be something that people weren't necessarily either that familiar with or weren't necessarily that familiar with as a incendiary. Christopher Babylon asks, I know to some people this might sound a bit ridiculous, but as someone who doesn't understand, and I've got a 13-year-old son who's also interested in knowing, why round cannonballs? Could they have not produced square cannon and therefore square cannon shot so there was less chance of the shot rolling around in bad weather or during action? It's not actually a bad question at all um, because it might seem obvious at first glance. 
And it's complicated by the fact, if you'll forgive the uh, mirror image of myself taking this picture, um, you can see here, this is from the Mary Rose Museum. They did actually have, in this case, a rectangular cannon <laughs> Um, down there at the bottom. This is obviously a replica. There is actually a few, a couple of examples on display as well of the originals, a bit rusted up. And these were anti-personnel guns with the rectangular mouthpiece basically ensuring that you've got a kind of a horizontal spray of shrapnel shot across the decks rather than wasting a bunch going high and going low. So with that said, why round cannonball? And for that matter, if you're going to have a round ball, why not a cylindrical shot and why a round shot? Well, it's two reasons. One is that if you have a round or vaguely round cannonball, there is no right or wrong way to insert it into the cannon, which is very important when you're under pressure. Whereas obviously if you have some kind of cylindrical device like a shell that you'd use in breech loading guns later on, and to be honest, some muzzle loading guns, there is very definitely a right way and a wrong way to insert it. If you insert it in anything other than the right alignment, it won't go in. And even then you've got to make sure it's pointing the right way if it's a shaped shell. Um, whereas with a round cannonball, it goes in whatever direction you put it in, which is a lot more important in the earlier times back when you're having to either chip cannonballs out of stone or rough cast them potentially out of iron at which point you don't necessarily have the widest of guarantees on the precise shape. So kind of generally fitting with a bit of wadding around it, regardless of what orientation you stuff it in, is a quite a useful feature. Plus, and this is a by far the more important element, it comes down to engineering with regards to high pressures, because if you have a square barrel, then as the explosive uh, it goes off whether gunpowder for the most part obviously in this period as it expands the hot gases all expand they push the projectile out the front but there is obviously a huge amount of pressure being created internally because that explosion is trying to expand equally in all directions and it's just the path of least resistance is to push this you know several pound or several dozen pound lump of iron or stone out the barrel rather than break the barriers around it which form the walls of the cannon and of course if that isn't the case either because the ball gets stuck or there's a small crack in the cannon that's when you get the cannon exploding which is mm, disturbingly common in the late medieval period um and as that pressure builds very very quickly you have to look for stress points and corners are great stress points. So if you have a square cannon barrel, even if you make all the walls equal thickness, there's going to be a lot more stress exerted around those corners. And because they are stress points, it also means that the pressure is much, will find it much, much easier to start to cause fractures at those corners, as it basically is pushing against a flat plane and a flat plane, let's say the left-hand side on the top, it's trying to push those apart. Now there's a point of stress where these two um, perpendicular forces are acting on the corner and all it takes is the tiniest crack to form because it's essentially being pulled in two directions at once and boom, there goes the gun in a way that you don't really want. Whereas if you have a round um, cannon bore, uh, the, the barrel of the gun, then because it is cylindrical, the stress is exerted, at least along the most axes, equally in all directions at once, which means there's no point at which you have dramatically opposing forces pulling or pushing in different directions, which makes it significantly less likely that the cannon is going to explode. Therefore, having a cylindrical bore is far superior to having a square bore, if you don't want to create a gigantic three-ton iron pipe bomb. And once you've created that cylindrical bore, then these various issues around the manufacture of ammunition in the earlier period that I mentioned, which is why you have this, the spherical cannonball come into play, and thus you get the round rather than the cylindrical cannonball. And the principle of stress being uh, collecting at corners and then causing failures, as opposed to uh, some kind of a rounded option, 
is actually something that crops up again and again and again throughout weapons engineering. Everything from the step down of a sword blade to the sword tang, if it's a sharp 90 degree corner, it's going to be far more likely to crack than if it is gently curved. Um, welding, when welding came in on ships, if you had a weld, welded, two welded plates that formed a 90 degree corner, um, i.e. a bigger, so let's say a smaller plate welded onto a bigger plate and that created like a negative space corner, then it was very likely going to crack. Um, and even when it comes to airliners in the early part of the Cold War period, one of the main reasons that the de Havilland Comet kept basically exploding in midair, or more accurately falling apart through, through stress failures, as opposed to the its competitor, the Boeing 707, which didn't tend to have this occur, was because the Comet had more rectangular windows, and that created stress points that over time built up metal fatigue from constant pressurization and depressurization, whereas the Boeing 707 had more rounded windows. Now, the Comet Mark IV eventually introduced rounded windows, but by that point, the damage was done to its reputation, and, well, that basically handed America the civil airliner market on a platter for several decades. But... You think people would remember these things because, as I say, it's not exactly a new thing, but it's something that crops up in engineering time and time again. I mean, it's for the same reason why, when you're talking about big major doorways, they tend to be arched rather than square. <laughs> it's not a necessarily an aesthetic choice. It's just because it's that's just stronger with less stress points than a rectangular doorway. Lon Johnson asks. Watching the six pounder loading, this is in the Nelson video, made me wonder what happens if the guy with the ramming stick drops it into the sea? I imagine they have spares, but were they conveniently located and available in large numbers? So, yes, they would have spares. Um, the ship's carpenter would have a few, and I mean, worst comes to worst, given the age of sail, ships tended to engage, not exclusively, but they tended to engage down one side. So if your rammer was lost for whatever reason, you could theoretically just whip across the other side of the ship and grab the rammer from the corresponding gun and hope that that side wasn't about to be engaged. But there weren't that many, you know, easily available options. Now, it depends which particular stick you've dropped. Uh, the rammer stick, particularly for ramming down the shot and it's uh, wadding and so forth you could extemporize to a certain degree with any old pole um any number of the various poles that they've got up to hand as you can see here but it, it's going to be a not quite as efficient the one you really really don't want to drop is the sponging stick because that's the thing that clears out obviously that's the one on the top of this the um display just here with the white bit on the left hand side because that's the thing that allows you to as the name suggests sponge out all of the burning embers and so forth which is going to make sure you don't get accidental misfires whilst you're in the process of loading the gun if you drop that again there is a spare across the way for the opposite gun but none of the others are going to really stand in duty for that. Whereas if the rammer, which is the one at the bottom of the three suspended over the gun port here, if that goes by the wayside, you're still going to get a clap around the back of their head from the gun captain. But you can probably extemporaneize with the wormer or even with one of these um, maneuvering wedge sticks or levers here until you can get a new one uh, made by the carpenter or you can snaffle one from, as I said, the other side of the ship. So it's not the world's biggest disaster, but it's really not ideal. Helen Spark asks, I know Mrs. Drack doesn't want to appear on camera, but is there any chance of more commentary from her? She's my favourite part of the hardtack-beef jerky episode. Sure, that's not necessarily a problem. I did ask Mrs. Drack before I gave that response. Um, so yeah, if we do more uh, sort of live naval food related videos she'll obviously be helping with that and if we do any other kind of live recordings around the house i'm sure she might chip in where appropriate uh, a little while ago, back we did a british versus pirates board game uh, sort of mini review where me and mrs drag played so you could just see our hands um so yeah if we were going to play some kind of naval board game then obviously she's my go-to opponent since she's right here so 
that would certainly be a thing. And if we do cover the admittedly relatively limited amount of South African naval history, like we did with Just Nuisance, the dog, um, then, of course, she'll chip in as appropriate, since that is, of course, her heritage. So, yeah, there's chances to hear Mrs. Jack here and there in various videos. And, of course, if we do eventually do a long video on sea mines, yes, the mine will return. Vokia asks, how has the ratio of enlisted to non-commissioned officers or similar to officers changed throughout the ages? Unfortunately, that's not a question I can answer easily uh, without a lot of extensive research, because whilst there are a lot of crew lists of ships around, most of them tend to list their crew either by specific rank or by surname, not by whether they're a commissioned officer, non-commissioned or warrant officer, etc., etc., which makes sorting through often you know hundreds upon hundreds of entries just for a single type, a single vessel, very difficult. And you've also got to bear in mind that as times change, exactly what that rank structure is is going to vary. So, for example, by sort of the 1500s, so the time of Mary Rose, you've got couple of admirals aboard her, the captain, the ship's master, and some pilots, they're the ones who are basically considered officers. And then everyone else is crew of varying kinds. Now, the soldiers might have their own officers within their complement, but they're not officers of every everybody on the ship. I, not everyone on the ship has to defer to them. That's a little bit of a separate structure. Um, and then you get to World War II, and World War One, as I say, there's a lot of crew lists, but I can't find very many to hand that go, this is how many officers, NCO, warrant officers, midshipmen, etc., etc. Whereas, ironically enough, of all the places, HMS Victory, her muster roll is, is actually one of the few that is divided up in that way. So in terms of commissioned officers, there are actually, well, if you include Nelson, obviously, then there are a total of 11 commissioned, fully commissioned officers aboard HMS Victory at the time of the Battle of Trafalgar. Uh, so the first lieutenant, Captain uh, Nelson, and eight lieutenants. There are then a further 16 non-commissioned and warrant officers, the ship's master, carpenter, surgeon, purser, armourer, various masters, mates, um, and some senior gunners. And then you have the midshipmen. There are 21 of those. Then there are 61 petty officers, quartermasters, uh, carpenters, crew, um, quarter gunners, that thing, things like that. And then there's everybody else out of a crew of just over 800, a total of 820. So that at least gives you some window into the Napoleonic era period. Um, and it, But then even within that structure, there are still four additional commissioned officers of the Royal Marines and another seven non-commissioned officers of the Royal Marines, who obviously, like the soldiers on Mary Rose, are in something of a different rank structure. Chief Iroll asks, could you talk about how officers of the Royal Navy were recruited for the South American Wars of Independence? Did any of these wars have back-channel support from the British government? And were there any notable contract terms, benefits or rewards for those who signed up to serve under the revolutionary governments? Well, all of these wars weakened Spain. And of course, as far as Britain is concerned, if there's one thing better than beating a continental rival into the ground such that they don't pose a threat, it's someone else beating a continental rival into the ground and weakening them so they pose less of a threat. So, generally speaking, most of the um, revolts by what would eventually turn into the South American countries we know today, although the alignments of exactly where the borders were back then, and indeed what even the countries were called, going to be called back then, could vary quite significantly compared to what they are now. The state of Gran Colombia, for example, doesn't exist anymore, although Colombia does, with very different borders. Nonetheless... With these uprisings against Spanish rule, you know, by the point that they were occurring, most of the British population and the government would kind of look with distant approval at the situation. Because I say it, um, 
It appealed to their general notions, plus it gave Spain quite a few black eyes, which, as far as they were concerned, was fine. Um, now, when it comes to how the Royal Navy officers were recruited, it was actually quite an active recruitment go it that was going on. And it wasn't just limited to the South American Wars of Independence. There's a reason that you know other na- nascent navies, whether it be they Greek or Mexican, etc., all had British officers in attendance, and even some European, smaller European navies as well. And that was essentially because Britain had come out of the Napoleonic Wars with a huge navy and a fearsome reputation and dominance of the seas. But of course, in peacetime, the navy numbers were cut down dramatically. Officers went off on half pay. Men could generally just be let go from the service entirely. And suddenly there were a lot of very experienced sailors from everything from able seamen all the way up to admirals who had not really much else better to do. And a lot of them had either developed a taste for active conflict or perhaps because of the length of the wars against France, first in its royalist and then in its uh, republican and then it's in its Napoleonic phases, had gone on for so long. They That was all they knew growing up. And for whatever reason, they wanted to continue fighting things, especially if that involved fighting enemies they'd fought previously, like the Spanish. Um, At which point, knowing this, the various smaller navies, and in this particular case, the South American countries, would send representatives to Britain and they would find officers that they knew had a fairly good reputation from the Napoleonic Wars who were on half pay And they would suggest that, well, maybe they would like to come and serve in this other navy because, um, well, they could offer them maybe a higher rank. They could offer them a little bit more freedom of operation and they offer them a chance to go and fight their old enemies again. And then the officers who either wanted adventure or wanted money or both would take them up on that and sometimes muster crews as well, because obviously if they were fairly successful, they were usually fairly well-known. If they were fairly well-known, they tended to be, if they're well-known and successful, fairly well-liked. And so bored sailors with nothing much better to do, but thinking, oh, there might be some prize money in this, would end up joining up with them as well. And that's how they end up in South America. Theoretically, this was all illegal because the Foreign Enlistment Act of 1819 barred British servicemen from enlisting in foreign armed forces without the direct permission of the king, which theoretically would never be given. Um, But it was one of those acts that, uh, thanks to the way British law works, was passed. And then because absolutely nobody thought it was a good idea, apart from uh, some politicians who basically wanted to signal that technically Britain was staying neutral in the Spanish-American Wars, it just kind of sat on the books and virtually no one was prosecuted for it. It was basically a club to hit people you didn't like with if they went and joined up and did something particularly obnoxious or joined somebody particularly obnoxious, but otherwise people just kind of ignored it. Um, They actually ended up having to pass another one in 1870 to give it any teeth whatsoever. But as far as notable contract terms, benefits or rewards for those who signed up, um, Mainly, it was higher rank than they might otherwise have had in the Navy, which in turn obviously meant higher pay. And because a lot of these navies were setting up for essentially the first time, they were also able to, in certain ways, dictate how that Navy would be structured, which usually meant they set it up along roughly Royal Navy lines, which included things like prize money, which they were very, very determined to get because, of course, in peacetime, uh, they wouldn't get prize money, but now they were able to fight somewhere else in peacetime and claim prize money, even though their home country was technically not at war with anyone. There were some kind of golden handshake benefits for specific officers who were targeted by the South American recruiters where they really, really wanted them as well. Tyron Munzer asks, were aerodynamics ever considered in shipbuilding or are the effects negligible compared to hydrodynamics? And if it was considered, how was it considered? Aerodynamic considerations for ships kind of went up and down, quite uh, depending on the time period. So back in the age of sail, when the entire ship's propulsion method was, of course, by wind, there was 
a consideration to aerodynamics at least as much as they understood it at the time because they did understand that big slab-sided ships like Centus Metrilidad had all the maneuverability of a brick and sleeker ships with less wind profile on their hulls were much easier to manage because obviously then the primary propulsive power was coming from the sails. So there were a degree, there was a degree of consideration, but of course it was a little bit ad hoc because there was no standard accepted scientific method for calculating these things at the time, and much the same way as there wasn't an accepted scientific method for hydrodynamic calculation until Froud came along. But there were a lot of rules of thumbs and ex, uh, institutional knowledge and such built up. Then you get into the steam era, the latter part of the 19th century, and a lot of uh, sort of a lot of aerodynamic considerations tend to go by the wayside, partly because once you get to the 1870s, the dramatic increases in efficiency and or speed that come in thanks to people like Froud, which thoroughly confuse everybody because you end up uh, with ships like I've mentioned before, like Inflexible, which completely breaks the rule of thumb compared to some of its contemporaries because it's shorter and fatter, which should make it more agile but slower, and yet somehow manages to be faster. But everyone was focusing on the benefits of that, whilst at the same time no one was really clearing 18 to 19 knots, except for some very, very exceptional ships, which meant considerations of aerodynamics, they, they, they were minimal. I mean, just look at French free dreadnoughts and tell me that anybody who built one of those was concerned in the least with aerodynamics. But then as you get into the 20th century and ships begin to hit over 20 knots regularly, then they start to go in the mids, the highs, and destroyers getting into 30 plus knot territory, followed obviously but later on by cruisers and some of the battle cruisers and so forth. And suddenly aerodynamics becomes much more important. Uh, people understand that it is also important on unusual designs. For example, Nelson and Rodney, aerodynamics were taken into account because the island or the bridge structure was going to be so far back as opposed to being almost at the point of rotation. It could, and as it turned out, did uh, affect their handling characteristics, especially at low speeds, in ways that captains used to con conventionally laid out ships may not necessarily be used to, um, but could be overcome with experience. And the reason there's a Sims class destroyer on screen is because the Sims class, as with many other destroyers, obviously by the sort of 1910s, 1920s, and then obviously with the Sims in the 1930s, they're going quite quickly. And the effect of aerodynamic drag is actually becoming something of a major concern, especially for these smaller, faster vessels. And so cutting down superstructure and shaping superstructure to try and slip through the air considerably more easily becomes a rather significant factor. And of course, you have wind tunnel testing, etc., already established. And that is generally how these things would be tested, because you already have water tank testing to test the hydrodynamics of the hull, but you could also test the, aer the aerodynamics of a ship's proposed upper works, both by a limited amount of calculation, but also by just making models and running them through wind tunnels to see how much resistance they generate. Because, again, kind of square cube laws when it comes to speed. When you're moving at 30 knots, having a big slab-sided superstructure can generate an awful lot more drag and might cost you, you know, appreciable fractions, if not whole knots of speed, as compared to a much more rounded, lower-profile superstructure. Switch374 asks... USS Texas BB-35 cost just under $6 million in 1910s money to build. If it was known at that point that the ship would end up serving through to 1945 and then become a muse museum ship, and a benefactor provided a sum of money to make it last better in this role, how would you change or improve the design of the sp internal spaces, the hull or the superstructure to improve it in this role? Keeping within the technology of the time and prioritising based on cost, what could you do with anything between quarter of a million up to a million dollars in money of that time period? To be honest, it's actually rather difficult because with that money, when you're looking at making the ship last considerably longer, 
your first instinct would just be make the whole plating thicker so it lasts longer. Um, perhaps make some parts of the ship that aren't structural and load bearing out of materials that are less likely to rust, like say brass. But of course, everything you do in that respect, except maybe the brass thing, will increase the ship's weight, thus increasing its displacement, thus in the short term making it less effective as a ship. One might be tempted to perhaps switch out its machinery for turbines, but at the same time, as both an, the only dreadnought battleship still floating and as the only battleship power plant that's still intact that is a vertical triple expansion engine instead of turbine, that may be robbing future generations of something of an experience. You could perhaps look at making the ship oil fired from the start. That might definitely help because that will avoid the need to convert her to oil firing later on, which will mean her interwar refits will cost less, which means either she's more attractive because she costs less to maintain, or if they're going to spend roughly the same money on the refit anyway, they can refit and improve other elements of the ship. The only other thing that I can think about doing in the early 1910s with that kind of money would be maybe going after some of the early decent uh, sort of construction grade stainless steels and using those in elements of the ship maybe in bulkhead walls and deck plating and so forth obviously not for armor or anything like that but if Porsche if you can find a stainless steel that's being manufactured in the early 1910s that has approximately similar characteristics in terms of you know yield strength um, you know tensile strength plastic and elastic deformation and so forth compared to the steel they were going to use to build the ship anyway then making some elements of the ship uh, at least as much as you can out of stainless steel might you know help well it won't prevent but it'll help hold back some of the corrosion issues she's faced since so i think that those would be the things i would try and do sapper ninja asks could the armor belt of uh, the fast battleship era, particularly the best protected, like say Yamato or KGV, reject a hit from a sandbox, onyx, or shipwrecks missile? Assume the best case for the armor belt, such as an oblique angle hitting on the center of the belt, etc. Would any of the more unusual schemes like Bismarck or Latorio do any better? Now, as I've said before, modern missile technology, or even 20, 30 year old missile technology, is not really my strong suit. But going on some very broad and general principles, most of these missiles weigh considerably more than even a 16-inch 50 Super Heavy Mark 8 shell, or indeed even Yamato's 18.1-inch shells, and they're impacting at considerably higher speeds than battleship shells typically would be at the far end of their travel. So these things mitigate against a battleship's belt rejecting them. On the other hand, most of these missiles are a generation or two away from the missiles that were designed specifically with heavily armoured warship targets in mind. And so they don't have the shape charge or armour piercing warheads that some of their older um, versions do. Although at least one of the missiles you listed apparently does have a semi armour piercing HE charge available. Most of them these days, as far, at least as far as I can tell, seem to just rely on mass and inertia to carry themselves through and then the warhead goes off, which is basically the properties of an HE shell. So theoretically, you should treat them like really big, really fast HE shells, which, as we've established earlier on in um, for the dry dock this year, you need some pretty substantial HE shells to blow through battleship armor. And if you're just treating it as an HE shell it m and the missile's hitting at, say, a 45 degree angle, that may not work. The one with the semi armor piercing HE shell, pro HE warhead probably will get through um, just through the sheer amount of explosive. But if the ship's lucky, and as we said, the missile's coming in at about 45 degrees it's probably going to splash and break up enough on the belt before detonation ensues that you're going to get 
a very large HE detonation, probably splinters, probably buckled plating. Um, the engine and other solid parts of the missile might also make something of a mess, just as kinetic penetrators. But in terms of rejecting the majority of the force of the incoming missile and having that expended outside the ship, I suspect, just as, as I say, an educated guess that in those ideal conditions, a Yamato or KGB belt might be able to reject such a missile. Of course, you could just then fit the missile with a uh, shape charge warhead or an armor piercing tip or, you know, make sure it hits in a perpendicular angle, etc., relatively easily, at which point that it would almost certainly compromise the armor belt. Um, as far as the more unusual schemes, Littorio, Littorio's belt may or may not do better because there's no armor piercing um, tip to decap, e even if it would work, which you know I've explained before. I have my reservations about that system, um, but it may it may work a little bit in that it might cause the missile to break up and or begin detonation further out from the armor belt, but then the internal armor belt isn't as thick. And if the infill between the outer belt and the inner belt is solid, then it's going to be potentially, it might even confine the explosion a little bit, which might make things worse. Um, Bismarck... Um, I, I don't think it's going to help, to be honest, um, because at, at least in my, again, somewhat limited understanding of large missile mechanical interactions with things like ship's hulls, either the missile is substantially getting through the belt or it isn't. If it isn't, then the hull ground protected sloped deck etc in turn side doesn't really make much odds other than catching splinters and little bits of blast that might partially make it through but then armored bulkheads and stuff on more conventional armor schemes would do the same if the missile does substantially make it through in you know less than ideal circumstances and given bismarck has uh, physically thinner armor than a kgv or a yamato there's even possible that some of the more interesting ones might then that sloped armor deck might provide a modicum of additional resistance, but if you've got a you know, thousand pound plus warhead detonating in the relatively small gap between the outer belt and the uh, well, the belt and the slope deck, I have a feeling that's just going to create some rather big chunks of metallic splinters being driven further into the ship. Uh, I don't think it's going to help all that much, but as I said, it would act as fairly effective splinter stopper if the belt is only partially compromised. And finally for this week, Ferrata Victrix asks, if you were to design an escape room themed around a warship in battle and then sinking, what ship dash era would you base it on and what would it involve? Assume money is no object, but human life is deemed valuable by the people paying for this. Probably the pre-Dreadnought period. And there's some very specific reasons, I think, for that, because if you base it much earlier, Age of Sail or Ironclad era, there's actually not that many rooms on those ships. So, you know, an escape room themed around a warship or a series of escape rooms, th there wouldn't be all that much you could actually work on. Um, you know, a gun deck is a rather large area and has a relatively simple get out, just go through the gun ports, um, if nothing else. And if you get into the Dreadnought era when it's just all big guns and the secondaries don't really have all that much more to do and they're very, very big, you know, that that's probably, I would say, not necessarily going to work. Whereas if you were looking at an escape room experience, at least the ones that I've experienced where the word escape room is a little bit of a misnomer because you might have to go through several rooms, um, then a pre-Dreadnought potentially has a lot more opportunities because you could start off in something that was resembling a main gun turret and then maybe that main gun turret gets knocked out or the rangefinder gets knocked out 
Um, and then you have to escape into the ship towards maybe either the secondary battery or the torpedo rooms. And then as the ship begins to sink, which is why you'd be heading further down in the ship to set, set this all up, um, then, you, yeah, especially if you were in a torpedo room, you could possibly, say, have a, torpe a big torpedo simulated to have been wedged against the way out. So you, you've come in one way, you can't go that way anymore because there's flooding, and then your way out is blocked by a fallen torpedo, and then everyone has to work together to get that torpedo up, maneuver into the torpedo tube, and then work out how to fire that torpedo, which would then clear the door, which would then allow you to escape, and then maybe you can have a, a hallway or a um, communications tube or a mast base which you can then crawl up to the quote unquote upper deck and then get out of there and that would be the escape from experience so yeah so maybe you would be you know, if in the, in the main turret you'd have to maybe put out work out how to stop a cordite fire or something like that and seal up the ammunition passages so that the fire that's outside the room doesn't spread and then you can make your way down further into the ship. Um, that Then that would be simulating like closing off bulkheads and uh, dealing with flooding. And then you get to the torpedo room where you have the escape experience that I just described. That would be my idea at least. 